Hello. In this video, we will look at art from the Rococo and Enlightenment period. These two styles that happened simultaneously at the tail end of the 17th and early part of the 18th century um, are an extension and response to the Baroque style of the previous generation. Now, Rococo is centered mostly in France, uh, and it surrounds the courts of two successive kings of France, Louis XIV and Louis XV. Rococo style is often confused or can sometimes be labeled as a, a, merely an extension of the Baroque in French culture. But I think that it deserves to be recognized separately because Rococo adds to Baroque style uh, a focus, an emphasis on aesthetic and on a very specific type of aesthetic that tries to overwhelm the viewer with ornamentation, with, de with decoration, um, and with beauty. So the question really when you're looking at a Rococo work is, is there such a thing as too much beauty? And if so, um, where is that line? And, and that line ultimately is something that is decided upon by the artist and by the viewer. And it really is an expression and an extension of style. Now, Rococo art is also um, in, imbued with a very specific type of spirit. It, it, it tries very hard, Rococo style does, to um, display an exuberance for life, a vitality that is, is very much a part of its time. Um, the culture in France during this time really did focus on trying to show a, a, a love of life and it, uh, uh, a, an overabundance and exuberance of, of uh, enthusiasm for the finer parts of life and for living life to the fullest. Um, now, art in previous generations has always been influenced by its time, but in the Rococo, I feel like it, it really is a style and a movement that is um, dictated by the social customs, by the, the, the life of the people of its time. In contrast, what's known as Enlightenment style is a, an extension not so much of the exuberant Baroque, but of the cerebral, of the thoughtful Baroque. Um, the other side to Baroque art is its focus and emphasis on the real, on things that happen in life, and art should reflect the reality of life. And so Enlightenment style focuses on this philosophy that art should be a reflection of what's observed in nature. Um, this is also a time when there's a, an emphasis all across society on this, on a scientific and a sobering approach to life. In order to understand life, in order to understand our natural world, you have to look at it objectively. And so Enlightenment style art tries to do just that. It also, Enlightenment, looks at, because of these objective looks at the, the nature of the world, at the nature of man, um, it leads to revolution. It sparks both the industrial and ultimately later social revolutions. So we start to see a movement away from the, the classical, uh, formal approach to a more, um, you know, a more thoughtful, a more realized approach to not just art and culture, but to all things. And we see that reflected in Enlightenment painters. Now, just like the Rococo is centered in France, 
there's a strong connection between Enlightenment and uh, England, and by extension, English colonies like America. In Rococo style, what we see in architecture is an extension of the Baroque. We see some of the traditions of French architecture coming out, uh, the influence of classicism. We see the use of columns and pediments, but it's the scale, it's the grandeur, it's taking this, the style that uh, had already existed and embellishing it, augmenting it um, to a point where you don't feel like it's possible to add necessarily more without diminishing it. Th that, that's ultimately the question for uh, Rococo artists is, you know, where do they stop ultimately? You know, where do you call a, 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 the style final? Um, or is there a point where you've really gone too far? And when we, we think about style and design that goes too far, we tend to think of it as kind of gaudy or self-indulgent. And for, for the Rococo artist, they really didn't believe that there was such a thing. They thought that more is always more. Now, uh, the leading Rococo architect was a man, a man by the name of Beaufran. Beaufran is responsible for the design of the Hotel Sibuis and other, he was very fashionable as an architect uh, for pri homes of private individuals. You know, this is a point where the courts were being rivaled by the wealthy elite. Um, it's, it's not so much birth that gives rise to your status as it is wealth. And that's a change that we're seeing happening. And, you know, these, these uh, leaders of industry, these leaders of business and finance, they want to live life uh, on the same kind of terms that the nobility in previous generations had lived. They want to show off their wealth by building large, impressive, palatial homes, by... Uh, in patronizing art and culture and having large collections of painting and sculpture and, and all of those elements that had for generations been the sign of being cultured. So what we see is this uh, wealth elite, the upper class socioeconomically, replacing the nobility. There comes a point in where wealth creates wealth, where instead of being a, a businessman, you are a financier. And the difference is, is that your money is what's generating your money, and you become what's known as independently wealthy. So the, for these families that achieved this status, they wanted to live, they were expected to live a certain type of lifestyle, and that included a home that would represent their wealth. It's still a propaganda message because it's still human nature. The difference here is that they're not as interested in being the political leaders. Ultimately, they do influence politics, um, but it's really more the cultural leadership. It's more the social and, and economic leadership that, that uh, they worry about. So these designs seem kind of similar to us. Um, you know, the, the, this is the next generation, the new generation of the bourgeoisie of the Gothic period, building these large, lavish homes where they're going to entertain, where they're going to welcome hundreds of guests and visitors for lavish parties of the you know, social season. And it's, it can be, they can be, the designs can be very formal. Um, they can also be very um, playful. And, but one thing that they definitely all have in common is an exuberance, an overabundance, uh, an indulgence in the beautiful, in the ornate. So this courtyard area, which is actually outside the house itself, uh, is a, a place where they would gather for large outdoor uh, events, you know, picnics, dances uh, in, during the, the, 
the, the social season. And it's very formal. And yet at the same time, it's, there's lots of decoration uh, in, in every element. Now, for many, these, there, these homes had generations. They, the wealth was passed from one generation to the other. And so instead of during the Rococo just simply rebuilding or knocking down and, re, and, and building new, um, they would add decorative elements to the point where even adding uh, you know, ornate um, special structures on their estates in the country where they would have these lavish celebrations. So this is one such place. Uh, this type of structure became really popular. It's basically a building whose only purpose is for entertaining and specifically um, for having musical entertainment, dances, chamber orchestra performances. Um, and these became quite popular during the period. This is the high point of Baroque music with uh, Mozart and other very, very famous Baroque composers of both symphonic music, chamber music, quartets. Uh, all of these elements were very popular in the period. So they built, these wealthy individuals would build structures just to have these elaborate dances and musical performances. The interior shows this love or, of decoration, this overabundance of ornate surface decoration. Uh, it's, it's almost, because it's so encompassing, it's almost difficult to, to tell the difference from the windows to the mirrors to the, you know, you, you're just sort of surrounded and engulfed by this visual onslaught of, of imagery. Now, this also speaks to the, because of all the windows and little spaces, speaks to the nature of the, the age um, in society. These, these uh, places, these structures were for more than just, you know, personal gratification. It was a visible sign of your wealth and having and, and celebrating anything art related uh, was, you know, music and art and architecture and literature and poetry and theater and performance. All of that was a way to show that you were a cultured individual, that you were at the high point of society. Now, in terms of church architecture in the period, there's, there's fewer examples. Um, the church's influence has waned a little bit. You know, we're moving through the Protestant Reformation. We're moving through all of the, and the, 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 the decentralization of church authority. Plus, the spirit of Rococo is looser. It's more individualistic. It's, it's a little less moralistic. That's one of the things about Baroque art, especially in the North, because it was so strongly moralistic. For the French, they, you know, they saw that as too heavy-handed. Um, their architecture, even church architecture, tends to be more free. It tends to be uh, more expressive. And we see that carried forward through the use of frescoes, through the use of plaster work, through the incorporation of new elements. You know, it's very much, Rococo is very much of its time. So they didn't want it to seem old and seem cl too classic and boring. Um, you know, things like adding the pipe organs and adding the, the clock towers and adding all these other elements become a very important part of Rococo style. It's very, very decorative. And for some, it's, it's a little too decorative. It's a, perhaps a little too indulgent. Now, Rococo painting in France is, uh, was dominated by a couple of figures, uh, Watteau and um, others like him who were interested in these very pastoral scenes. Um, you know, he wanted to show sort of the, a, a softened view. You know, the previous generations were, it was a response, it was sort of a Baroque, sort of a backlash to the strong realism and, and uh, religiosity of the Renaissance. And now we're gonna see paintings that focus instead on, uh, you know, scenes of everyday life, but everyday life for a very, very small segment of the population. 
it's not reality in terms of this is how everyone lives. It's how the extraordinarily wealthy live. And, and you know, they do live this way. It's a, you know, they, they have time. Their, their wealth allows them the, to focus on music and focus on the more beautiful parts of life. So these become themes, images of picnics, images of people at rest, people at play, people uh, you know, indulging themselves in various forms of art and culture. The style is similar. It's informed by Renaissance realism, but it's, it doesn't take itself quite so seriously. It doesn't take itself uh, and, and the style quite so uh, such a focus on classical realism. It uses the techniques of light and color and shading and modeling, but for other purposes. It's more allegorical. It's more expressive. This is one of the most famous paintings of the style of the period. It's Watteau's Pilgrimage to Cythera. And here we have this imagined kind of fanciful scene of this large party of, you know, beautiful, wealthy, young individuals. Uh, and they're on this pilgrimage was kind of like a, a trek, a, a, a walk through the woods, so to speak. And they're, they're headed to some fanciful picnic. And they're, they're kind of waited upon by... The, these flying cupids and cherubs, and it's supposed to suggest that love is in the air and that it's spring and it's all of these sort of romantic notions about life. So it's not real in the sense of realism uh, that we'll see with enlightenment, but it's it's a more romantic realism. It's It's what we wish life were like for all, but it really isn't for everyone, and it's and even for these few, it's not. It's sort of this romantic notion of life for the wealthy, for the elite. Even in the portraits that are supposed to be more candid, um, you know, that are supposed to be more. You've just ca caught her uh, um, in, uh, you know. In, in a candid moment, she's without her wig and she's lounging on a chaise and she is, um, you know, reading in the early afternoon. She's just finished responding to her correspondence of the morning and there was a writing desk there and she's, uh, this is before she's preparing for the evening, uh, you know, at, it, before she's she's not really ready to receive here, and yet she's still wearing this incredibly elaborate gown, and she's still ha wearing the the makeup. And she's the point is is that it was supposed to be oh well this is just how life is like at home, but we know that that's probably not true. It's just a romanticized version of that. And even for the man, you know, this is he's in his study and he's. Uh, you know, examining his holdings and, you know, finishing his, his letters for the day, his work, basically, before he goes off to prepare for his, you know, the, for a party or the evening celebrations. It's supposed to be that candid moment at home, but again, it's romanticized. Now, Boucher became famous for his his allegorical scenes for his paintings of Cupid, um, like we see here, um, you know, the, the romantic view of the classical, which, you know, classicism has some uh, allegorical elements to it, but this is, this is sort of a fancy, fancy, fanciful version of these scenes. It's not trying to, to directly connect to any of those myths or, or, or legends. It's really just sort of trying to borrow from it in terms of subject to give uh, a reason for these beautiful images. Now, on the flip side of that is enlightenment. And enlightenment seeks to show life 
as it is. The, you know, Chardin leads the Enlightenment movement in England, and he wants to paint scenes of real people just living life, because to him, life is what's beautiful. And by examining life as it's lived, not only do we learn more about ourselves, but it makes the art more meaningful. So here, the attentive nurse, and she's soft boiling eggs and preparing breakfast and something she's probably done a thousand times and will do a thousand more. And it is, it could not be more mundane. But that's what Chardin says, this is what's beautiful. That's what Hogarth says, this is what's beautiful, is the, the everyday is what's beautiful. You know, peeling potatoes is not a task that the cook may have you know, relished, and yet there's no great glory of the feast without the work without the labor. And so what these artists, these enlightenment artists are doing is saying that the real beauty is not in the romantic notions and the grandiose, it's in the everyday. It's in the, the mundane, boring tasks that have to happen to make the special tasks possible. You know, these these paintings are very much about, and this style is very much about uh, the relationships between social structures, the relationships between people and life, and how you know your your class determined your status, and your status determined the ebb and flow, the path that your life would take. Now, Hogarth became famous for his paintings. Uh, that dealt with these social structures. Um, this is from a series that he did about marriage and relationships in contemporary life in his time. So he's not choosing, you know, classical subjects and themes. He's saying this is the reality of life. And regardless of your social status, whether you're the cook or whether you're the lord of the manor, there are expectations. So here we have the marriage contract, and the two fathers negotiate the contract based upon, uh, you know, the wealth and of the dowry of the girl, the standing and title of the man, and how they will be married together. And they seem, you know, as unlikely a couple as you might imagine. There's no Cupid here. There's no, you know romantic notion of love in this version marriage is simply that it is a a contract to between two families between two in parties that will ultimately lead to the conjoining of the two families and their wealth and fortune so tradition and social status dictate what's necessary that you may not get to marry who you love you might have to marry uh, someone based upon the match and how what it does for the families. And Hogarth, in his series of paintings, was unafraid to call into question and to show the the real nature of what you know the ramifications of these decisions, what life was really like. You know, yes. Uh, you can celebrate all night, but it's going to have consequences. Yes, you know, you may not uh, fall in love, but, uh, rom you know, kind of a head over heels romantic notion of love. But that doesn't mean that the decision to marry, the decision to have a rela that relationship is wrong or inappropriate, that it leads to a certain type of lifestyle. And it's dirty. It's messy. It's... Uh, broken. It's it's all those things that Rococo is not. Um, it's not just you know cupids flying around and fanciful parties. In America, Enlightenment style is kind of short lived, but it sets an important stage for neoclassicism. Um, American version of of uh, 
Enlightenment painters uh, or painting is led by two important figures, both trained in Europe, and they bring this style back with them, Benjamin West and John Singleton Copley. And they are classically trained as painters, and they, they really show off their skills. This is uh, West, the death of uh, General Wolf, and here he's showing what he imagines this scene to have been. The you know they're still we're, America's still an English colony, so they're still red coats and they're still British soldiers. And you know Wolf was this romantic figure. He's a hero. He's fallen in battle with the French in the French and Indian Wars, and he's. You know, it's this romantic scene of and dramatic scene of of what's just taken place. So it's loosely historically based, but he's taken some liberty with the composition and the sequence of events. What makes uh, American Enlightenment painting interesting is it's sort of it's inspired by uh, to a certain extent the. Um, the English and their approach, that kind of you know straightforward approach to documentary documenting uh, everyday life, and it has a little bit of the fanciful, a little bit of the romantic. Um, so you know it's it's a little bit of both. This is West, one of his most famous paintings. It's the Penn's Treaty with the Indians, and here we see. William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, and his uh, dealings with and brokering with the Indians to trade, to barter. Um, you know, the, the point is, is that early on, American painting was seeking heroes. It was seeking myths. You know, Americans didn't have quite the same traditional relationship with um with the past, it was such a new place, a new country. So there was a, a desire early on to find heroes, to make heroes if necessary. This is Copley's Watson and the Shark. And again, a historical event that did actually take place, uh, shipwreck, uh, you know, with shark attack and this heroic figure battling off the sharks from the small boat, trying to save the survivors, you know, but then you see it's kind of romantic. You start questioning, well, you know, why is the, why is the fallen sailor nude? And, you know, this seems a little unrealistic. Uh, in fact, many things about the scene just don't seem to match what would be reality. And yet, it's, it is loosely based on something historical, creating a heroic figure, creating this, uh, in, you know, this new um, legendary figure that America can claim as its own. Copley became famous for his portraits, and he painted portraits in America for a variety of important individuals, both... Uh, you know, social elite, wealthy individuals, and then some leaders of uh, early American politics. Here's his painting of Paul Revere. Now, Revere, of course, is famous for his ride of, you know, the British are coming, the British are coming. Um, and even that story has been, you know, embellished to create, to make Revere a more heroic figure. Revere chooses in his own portrait that he had, he commissions Copley to paint, to be depicted as a silversmith, as his occupation. And I think that that's another element of American Enlightenment, is early on, these, these individuals don't come from the same level of wealth and family connection as they do in Europe. Um, you know, these aren't independently wealthy figures. These are people who are newly wealthy, but it's limited to their position in colonial society. And the colonials were always seen by Europeans as slightly less than, slightly less cultured. Uh, you know, colonial style, colonial culture was always a little bit behind that of, you know, the main body of Europe. So what makes Rococo an enlightenment 
interesting early on is it's this sort of gap. It bridges the gap between the Baroque that had come before, and it sets the stage for neoclassicism and romanticism that we'll see in later in the 19th century after we have the revolutionary period and the the federalist period in america that we'll talk about in subsequent lectures